shaken yet or fist bumped or good morning. Good morning. Good morning. Good morning. Are you a handshake or a fist bumper? Oh, you're you're with him? I'm with Craig. about this side? <laughs> Cold hands, warm heart. Who else did I miss? I'm going to get you. Good morning. Back here. Good morning. Good morning. Good morning. Good morning. You know, this is what Sunday morning is going to be like, right? Right? See, you're going to laugh. Now I'm going to go this way. Pastor, you have like 30 seconds. so I'm gonna Okay, I can do a quick one. I can do a quick one, Dr. Fulbright. I don't have an acolyte this morning. Good morning. Good morning. How are you? 30 seconds, I'm stretching it out. Yeah, you are. <laughs> it's all good. My name is Reverend Dr. Elise Fulbright. I'm sure you've seen me on video. I've actually been here a time, no, just a time, one time and a time of coming. And so I'm so glad that you have made it a point to be here with us this morning. If you were not familiar, this is your new pastor, Reverend Dr. Amber Kukowski Linton. She is full of joy and full of energy on a Saturday morning. Amen. Does this one work? All right. The apprentice is working, so we're going to extend grace to him. Thank you. I'm good. So before we get started, we are going to start in prayer. I'm going to lead us through a time of conversation. I just want to set some parameters. This is a conversation. This is not a debate about your positioning. This is not a um, trying to change people's minds in any aspect. This is more about information and education and helping you to prepare your hearts and mind for the new season of life and ministry for Mooresville United Methodist Church. In a uh, new... Uh, article, not an article, in an email that was sent out, you had an opportunity to raise questions and no one submitted it online, but there is a paper in the back. If you would like to write down questions, that is your opportunity. We have members of staff parish. Once your question has been written, that you can raise it and they will bring it to me. Please know if I read the question and it's not pertinent to this conversation, it will not be addressed. It just won't. There may be other opportunities for me to address the question. If I feel that is relevant, then that is up to me because I asked that those questions were submitted in advance. This is not to hinder our conversation. This is really to put parameters on it so that we can all get what, what is needed for however it is needed during this hour and a half. We won't be here all night, I promise. So let us pray. Holy and gracious God, we give you thanks and praise for the beauty of this day, the opportunity that we are able to be your hands and feet in this world, for the opportunity that we have to gather into the safe place called sanctuary. And while we are not worshiping on a Sunday, we still come with a worshipful heart. We come with the mind of Christ. We come seeking to hear and to listen and perhaps even to be challenged by your spirit for how we can be better equipped disciples that make disciples for Jesus Christ for the transformation of the world. So we pray that your Holy Spirit will lead us and guide us. We pray that your Holy Spirit will open our hearts and our minds, our ears to hear what you may be saying in this moment. And I pray for this church in this new season of life and ministry, for all that is going on in this town, in this city, in and of itself, and the expanded mission field that is emerging among us, may we truly be about the business of your kingdom on earth as it is in heaven. In Christ's name we pray. Amen. So we come to this conversation this morning with many curiosities. 
many curiosities because I've heard many of them over the last several months. And so we're going to address them head on. There have been many misinformation circulating, so we're gonna address those head on. There are some questions that have already been submitted, and so we will um, see if those are pertinent to this conversation. And also, if indeed I ask that if there is something that you raise and I feel that it is out of bounds, respect that I call it out of bounds, and we go from there. So the first point I want to address is the United Methodist Church. You do know you're a United Methodist Church, right? Okay, this is participatory. You can say yes out loud. It's all good. <laughs> Amen. And so with the United Methodist Church, the United Methodist Church is in an influx right now. That's what I like to call it. We're at a time and a point where there are some decisions that need to be made, but yet this daggum COVID keeps preventing the decisions from being made. For many of you who may be unaware, the United Methodist Church was to convene a general conference, which is the law abiding, excuse me, the decision making body for the global entity of the United Methodist Church. That meeting was supposed to be convened in 2020. But if you've lived even a minute, you know what 2020 was like. <laughs> And so in 2020, we were unable to convene the general conference and it was postponed to 2021. Well, here we are, 2021. We've been through Delta, Omicron, and all the other Greek alphabet of this COVID uh, variations. And so that was postponed. There is supposed to be another postponed, postponed general conference to convene in 2022. I would suggest that in light of what we are experiencing right now with the Omicron variant and perhaps others that may arise, that it is highly unlikely that there will be a general conference in 22. So then what does that mean? I do not know. <laughs> we all don't know. Um, we thought that we would be past this situation, but here we are, we're not. And so what does that mean for a local church? I'll get to that, but what was the general conference supposed to do? Every four years, the general conference convenes itself so that the business of the church with those delegates, 863, that is uh, global delegates, not only just from the United States, but in other continents of the world, that convene to create the policies, practices, and procedures of the United Methodist Church. There are a host of things that needed to be addressed, but one of the more elevated topics was this matter of human sexuality. And the church was going to make a decision, perhaps, uh, regarding this understanding related to human sexuality. That has, that is, again, one of those elevated topics that is part of the postpone, postpone, postpone general conference. Let me give you a little context. This matter of human sexuality has been a part of the United Methodist ethos since around 1972. When the language was introduced into our rule book called the Book of Discipline, where it specifically states um, a position related to human sexuality, 1972. So from 1972, we as the United Methodist Church have been going back and forth, back and forth, back and forth, back and forth, related to this matter of human sexuality in order to perhaps come with a more inclusive understanding. A decision was made when a special call general conference was convened in 2019, which created perhaps for some more strategic excuse me, more stringent language within our book of discipline related to this matter of human sexuality. A decision was made. But as many delegates and those within our United Methodist Church globally begin looking at the landscape of what it means to be Christ followers, there has been a growing concern related to our stringent wording related to those persons who identify uh, as LGBTQIA. There is also some misconceptions, and I wanna say that 
intentionally related to, well, if indeed we have a position related to this matter of human sexuality, then why are bishops and superintendents and churches doing whatever they want to do? I would suggest that that is not the full truth at all. And we cannot allow one or two matters or situations to erode the fullness of what it means to be United Methodist. Yes, there are some persons who have violated the discipline, but the matter of human sexuality is not the only violation of the discipline. There is a violation of the discipline when you don't pay your tithes or your apportionments, but we're not having a whole debate about that. There are other violations within the discipline for which we don't elevate, but why is it this particular matter of human sexuality? One would never know. And those are the questions I have of God. I got a lot of questions of God. <laughs> but here we are. And so what does it mean for the local context of church and ministry, United Methodist churches? It means that you continue to be faithful Christ followers doing the work of Christ in your local context in order to represent Christ and introduce persons into a relationship with Christ so that they can become a disciple that makes disciples. That's what you're supposed to be doing right now. There is no church decision that needs to be made. There is no church debate that needs to be had, in my opinion, because there is nothing to discuss. We don't know. Even with the protocol being elevated, the protocol is a legislative matter that has been raised that many on all sides of the matter of human sexuality has come to, at this point, agree is a great way for uh, the United Methodist Church to move forward. But even when that legislation is raised, it will not be the same legislation that is the outcome for what is voted on. So what I am sharing with congregations is to get riled up into this argument right now deters and distracts you from doing the mission for which you are called to do, period. And I would suggest that when a decision is needed of congregations, I promise you, you'll be the first to know. I promise. <laughs> because what will that decision mean? Again, I don't know, but here is a scenario. If indeed the protocol, which is a legislative uh, item that has been raised that provides an opportunity for uh, a way forward for the United Methodist Church, if indeed that passes, then it goes before the annual conferences. Annual conference, which is you reside within the Indiana Annual Conference made up of 1,056 congregations across the state. They, all of us, have opportunity to send persons as members of the Annual Conference session, which you have one person who is your lay member to Annual Conference and your lay leader who has an opportunity to represent, represent your church at Annual Conference session. So if the protocol passes as it is proposed today, then local congress, uh, then those delegates, excuse me, those members of annual conference session may have an opportunity to vote on if the Indiana conference will continue to remain a United Methodist conference. If that passes, congregations don't have anything to do but continue to be United Methodists. If indeed a congregation has expressed that they would like to join with another Methodist expression, that's when a decision will need to be made. But as you can see, there is a whole lot more that needs to be done before a local church is ever able to make a decision. And to join with a, another expression of United Methodism, that comes with a cost. What that cost is, I have no idea. Again, there are so many other steps that need to be made. And it specifically says that you must join a new Methodist expression. So that doesn't mean that you could just go rogue and be independent. That also doesn't mean that a faction of the congregation holds the whole position of the whole church. Because as I am learning and experiencing, there are positions within churches, but it's not the position of the church. There is a difference. There are those that identify as the labels that continue to circulate as conservative, 
There are labels that continue to circulate as those that are progressive, and there are labels that continue to circulate for those that are centrist. An individual label does not characterize the position of a whole church. I want to be very clear about that because that is something that I keep hearing from congregations. Well, we identify as conservative. Well, no, your faction could identifies as conservative, but if I was to take a vote of the whole church, that may not be the whole truth. Some of the things that I am encouraging congregations to do at this point is to make sure that your membership roles are accurate. Because at the end of the day, it is those professing members who are on roll and roster who will have an opportunity to vote if a vote is taken by a congregation. So making sure that the membership roles are accurate. Making sure that those who continue to visit regularly, encouraging them to join in membership, because that's important, clearly. But that's all that a church needs to do continue to be the church in the local context of ministry, not debating and fighting about what the church will be some five, 10 years from here, but continue to show the love of Christ in their own context. But then also administratively, making sure that your membership roles and rosters are accurate. That's where we are related to the United Methodist Church and where we are regarding a decision whenever it is to be made. We don't know, and there is not a decision that needs to be made. So then let's move down to Morrisville United Methodist Church and your new pastoral leader. <clears throat> there have been many questions about, now how did this process happen? So for those that are unfamiliar, I would invite your members of staff parish to stand because I'm not putting y'all on the spot, nor am I throwing you under the bus. I just want people to know who you are. <laughs> so members of staff parish, will you please stand? There is a couple others that are missing, but these are your members of staff parish currently. Along, thank you. Along with Zach, who is ill today, and I, and I encouraged him to stay home because we don't need it. <laughs> we need him to be very well. And so I began a conversation with these persons who are staff parish, which per discipline is the per personnel arm of the church. I began meeting with them even when Pastor Dennis was still here and he acknowledged his retirement, which I believe was at the end of March or April. I've been here a lot, friends. <laughs> and so we began the conversation of what does Mooresville who does Mooresville United Methodist Church need in regards to a pastoral leader in this new season of life and ministry? And we had a series of conversations. They had the opportunity to complete a profile, which is a church consultation form. And in that church consultation form, nowhere, and I'll read it, and it can be distributed, nowhere did it have any conversation related to your position as a church related to this matter of human sexuality, nothing. In it, it talked about a pastor that, I'll read it to you verbatim, I'm not taking anything out of it. We are looking for an engaging pastor whose sermons and preaching style relate broadly to both young and old congregants. They used the word old, I didn't. He or she, <laughs> he or she, should possess the gifts needed to develop and lead us toward a vision for reaching the unchurched in our community and ministering to those in need. That's a synopsis of what was, what was asked of your next pastoral leader. Along with other attributes that were stated that related to um, leadership and vision, personal relationship with God, a pulpit preacher, a mission and community engagement, a communicator and administrator, and one with competence. Those were the seven attributes that were outlined for what and who they, your staff parish, identified as what was needed in a next pastoral leader. So once that was received, a prayerful discernment process took place along with staff parish, with the bishop and other superintendents to identify who said person was. 
Again, in that profile, it had nothing to do with the perceived position of this church related to the matter of human sexuality. Nothing. It had everything to do with how we identify those who are called by God and set apart for lifelong ministry in the United Methodist Church. And is that person able to lead this church into God's preferred future? Period. And, so, and through that discernment, we were eager and excited to have a pastor to rise in um, very boldly in our prayers. And we believe that we have identified the pastor that fits the profile for which was provided by this church, which is Reverend Dr. Amber Kakosti Lytton. I will give her an opportunity to share about herself broadly as she has been in conversations with some of the leadership and also with Staff Parish. But for others of you, you may not have had that opportunity to hear the truth of who she is. And so this is an opportunity for her to share. Is that mic working? I think so. Good morning. Good morning. I'm gonna say something and you're gonna say amen. Brothers and sisters, isn't it a beautiful day to be in God's house? See, you're already right there with me. You were right there. Um, we are glad to be here. You've maybe seen me on video. Some of you I've got to be able to, to meet in the quilting group. Some I got to meet when I was here and then uh, for uh, other meetings. And then um, i am just been trying to meet several of you this morning. But let me pause and introduce to you some of our family is here today. Uh, my husband Chad is here. Um, Maddie is our nine-year-old. He's our youngest. He is here sitting next to Maddie is our niece, McKenna. And sitting next to McKenna is our son, Mikhail. And Mikhail and McKenna are six days apart. McKenna is my sister's daughter. And yet um, I proudly just call her one of my own kiddos. And then her brother, Brayden, is typically with us as well. He's 19. And uh, so when, and then we have our oldest daughter, Miranda, who's 21, and then her boyfriend, Maurice, who we call Mo. And so now Chad and I really have six kids. And so when we come walking in somewhere, like when we came to Mooresville and Kim um, and Roger walked us through so the kids could see all of the church, and then we went to Applebee's afterwards, it was like we were the Brady Bunch. We just went right in there and just made ourselves at home. And so um, the kids uh, had a great time. Um, Roger and his wife and Kim are wonderful hosts as we toured the entire church and just became very, very excited uh, about the possibilities here. So we were learning about you all. And now let me tell you a little bit about me. I've been in ministry for 21 years. Uh, when I was 14 years old, uh, I, at a Sunday night service, came forward to pray. And during that prayer time, I distinctly felt and, and heard the Spirit of God say, Amber, you are called to preach. And I said, okay. I was 14 years old, and all I wanted to do was get up from being able to pray and go and tell my dad, who's on staff at our church when I was growing up, and be able to tell him, Dad, I'm telling you, the Spirit just said I am supposed to pray and preach with a microphone. And so we started to do all of that, went through um, a process. I went uh, through a lot of different classes, uh, became a leader in our youth group, enjoyed church. We were at church Sunday morning, Sunday night, Friday night. Just about every time the doors were open, it was our family that either unlocked it or locked it. That's just how we did. And then, you know, back when you did the afterglows, you guys remember the after, like going way back, right? Our family was all about going and then continuing church, hanging out with people. That's my culture. That's my DNA. We like to do life with our congregations. And so we have served all over northern Indiana. And this will be as far south as we have ever served. And so uh, you can probably hear I have a strong central Indiana twang. That even when I lived in South Bend, they couldn't take that twang away from me. And it just comes and it's just who I am and that's how I am. Someone I met this morning said, oh, you got a little twang to you. I said, oh, well, then I must be comfortable because I twang when I'm comfortable. And so that's...
We'll just keep going. The, the, Greg, you're doing great. You're doing great. You're doing fantastic. Thank you for what you're doing there. Um, so my passion is basically, I can sum it up. I want to show love, share love, and spread love. Everywhere that we go, we want to spread the love of Jesus Christ with others. So if it's in church, that's great. This is our ministry hub. This is where we come to check in with God. This is where we come to be uh, spiritually nourished. This is where we come to just <sighs> sit in the presence of God with our brothers and sisters. But we come here to then be equipped to be sent out because we're not just coming. We actually are called to go show, share, and spread love. And so I, uh, Dr. Fulbright, filled out my profile and asked, could I please be placed into a community that really wants to be sent into the community? I want to go to school board meetings. I want to go to the basketball games, which I hear we uh, won by one point the other night, 37 to 38, and it was it's a low-scoring game. So I am interested in a church and a body of believers who actually want to go into the community and show, share, and spread the love of Jesus Christ. So that means we're going to have to have hangout places where we don't meet here. We meet in the community. And we build relationships with people who are in the community. That, that is my passion. I want more people to know the love of Jesus Christ. Whether or not they ultimately come through the doors here or not, we want them to experience the love of Jesus. That is what gets me up in the morning. That's what excites me. That is what you will hear from the pulpit. You will hear biblical sermons. You will hear sermons that say, here's what uh, Jesus said. And so here's what Jesus did. And so now what are we going to do? We're going to go show, share, and spread the love of Jesus Christ all throughout our community. So that is my passion. Uh, I actually... In, and not too long ago finished uh, my doctorate degree where it was all about showing, sharing, and spreading the love of Jesus, walking different congregations through that process of how we can learn to go and do that. How can we identify our values? How can we live into our values? And how can we live passionately for Jesus Christ? That's what I'm about. And really, when you get to know my family, they're way better than I am. So when you get to meet them, they're, they're the best parts of the deal that you're going to get here because they have talents beyond talents beyond talents. Uh, but Chad can sing. Nobody ever wants to hear me sing. So Greg, if we start to sing, I'm just going to trust you will always mute me because we don't, we don't want to scare anybody. But if we need to sing, I'm going to ask Chad to come up and sing because we don't want me. All the kids can sing. I can't do it. So that's a little bit about me. I mean, in a nutshell, because there's a lot to get to know, right? What you're going to know is that I love people. What maybe you've already experienced this morning is I'm a hugger. And, but if you don't hug, it's okay. I'm not going to force hugs on you. But I'm a hugger. I want to know your name. I want to know your kids' names. I want to know what's going on in your life. I want to show up when you invite me to your hospital rooms for your surgeries. And when we go through tough trials and when we need to celebrate somebody going home to be with Jesus, we're going to do that really well. We're going to love on one another. We're going to grieve together. And we're going to celebrate their life here on earth. And we're going to celebrate their life in heaven with Jesus forevermore. This is a church community. This is a faith community. We're going to do all those things. And we might even ring a cowbell in the process. I am convinced that every single one of us needs more joy in our life. So in the pulpit, there's going to be a cowbell. And when it's somebody's birthday or when something really great happens or when Mooresville wins state, we're all going to have cowbells, and we're just going to celebrate. Anything that happens, we want to celebrate that together. I don't know about you, but in this past two years, wouldn't you have thought we need a little bit more joy? And so if we can be a little silly, and there will be a Sunday, I will tell you my entire cowbell story, and then you'll understand it a little bit deeper beyond just being this silly, goofy thing that I do. 
It actually has a sacred and holy meaning, and I look forward. That's a little suspense. It was like if it was a commercial or if this was a sitcom, this would now be a to-be-continued uh, for you to come back and learn that later. So these are things that are important to me. These are values that are important to me. Uh, as a spiritual leader of this community, I want to get to know the other leaders in our community so that we can network and we can work together so that we really can through Mooresville and our surrounding areas so that we really can show, share, and spread God's love together. Is that enough? You want more? No. Okay. Not that I don't want more. It's just they, they have more time with you to get to know you. We can't give you the whole episode. It's like binging on Netflix. They don't need all of that right now, just over time. So that's your pastor. And many may say, well, well let me also say, this is an unconventional means for us to introduce a pastor to a congregation. We don't do this. However, because I have been in a, a constant presence here <laughs> with Staff Parish particularly, we wanted to make sure that that which is circulating, which is untrue, to be dispelled by the truth of who your pastor is. I also want to share in the conversations that we have had in Staff Parish that so oftentimes the demise of a local context of ministry is because of its members, not the pastor. And we even heard in Staff Parish that there is circulation in the community that I heard y'all were fighting amongst each other. I may be paraphrasing, but that's the gist of what was said. And so now we have a community that may be unchurched, dechurched, and looking for a relationship with Jesus and will be fearful of coming here even as you have a high energy, high capacity leader simply because they don't want to be in the fight, another fight, especially in the church. So how do we change that? The change comes with the conversations that we have. The change comes with the information for which we share. The change comes with a heart willing and wanting to do what's best for Christ, for God's kingdom in this place, period. So yes, you may have preferences that you wanted a male as a, as a pastor, not a female. Well, here we are, blank, uh, another question for God, not me. <laughs> um, there may be questions regarding Pastor Amber's personal beliefs regarding this matter of human sexuality. I don't think that that's fair because if you know her personal beliefs, then you've already, I would suggest, begin having a bias and not able to experience her leadership. So, no. Many of our pastors truly lead all and serve alongside all people, period. Yes, we have our, the matters that make our heart sing or perhaps the uh, opportunities to be prophetic or even some of the things for which we stand on regarding the inequities and injustices in the world, but that does not preclude us from being the leader and serving alongside all people. And I know people have a hard time with that. But here we are. If we're truly going to be the body of Christ, if we're truly going to emulate what that means in the world, then we have to come to an understanding individually and collectively for what that is and what that means. So I'll give it a pause. Members of Staff Parish, are there any questions that I see one? Members of the congregation, is there anyone that would like to raise a question? Again, if I feel it's out of bounds, I'll state that. Is there anyone that would like to raise a question? They're getting a mic for you, and I will ask you to share your name. My name's Herb Haggard. I've got a question. You were talking about the conference. Uh, and Which conference? The Indiana conference or the general conference? The general that's... conference. Okay, I'm listening. Okay. The direction of the United Methodist Church, uh, I guess the question is, is the split, is that over the fact that one party wants to follow the Bible and one party feels the Bible is outdated? So what's, so what's the position on the United Methodist Church? The conservative side, I would assume, wants to keep the Bible as it's written. The progressive side feels that the Bible is outdated because God started years ago or hundreds of years ago and is not in tune to the changes that exist in the society today. 
So my question to you is United Methodist Church want to follow the Bible or think that the Bible needs to be adjusted? I would suggest that the United Methodist Church continues to follow the Bible in our Wesleyan quadrilateral scripture is foundational in all that we do. And so people's interpretation of the Bible perhaps needs to be adjusted. But our understanding of who God is and how the Bible li is lived out in current realities is who we are. It's always who we've been. Scripture experience, reason, and ex uh, scripture tradition, reason, and experience is the foundational understandings of who we are as Wesleyan. And so as it, when I hear that question related to the Bible, it gr gives me great concern because what are we really talking about? Because if we're really talking about the Bible and its holistic understanding, this matter of human sexuality is minute. The Bible also talks about slavery, so is that still a thing? The Bible talks about being able to have multiple wives. Is that still a thing? So as we have known through history, there have been many different understandings of how to interpret the Bible. And we have come to a point, I would suggest, that the Bible is being seen in a different lens because of where we are in society. The upcoming uh, separation within the United Methodist Church has nothing to do with the Bible. It has everything to do with people's understanding related to human sexuality. Well, I think uh, you know, the Bible basically says it's Adam and Eve, that's how it started. And so sexuality is a major issue, and uh, I have trouble with that. A lot of trouble with that. So my question still is, if the church does split because we're in flux right now, so is the United Methodist as it stands going to stay as they have been, or is this progressive side, and now I've got papers here showing the cost of what some churches have paid in order to make a change, anywhere from $200,000 to $700,000 plus a lot of other information in regards to your assets and all that. So my question is, I think it's gonna come up, and it's been talked about for some time, that church is gonna split. So United Methodist Church will be one side, I'm not sure what, is the other side gonna be called global? And if so, what's the position? Because if you do follow it, and I agree, it does talk about slavery, it does talk about that. And I do believe that you will face God, and he will judge what you've done and how you've done it. And we're not to judge that, but on the other hand, I still believe the Bible is the basics, and that's what we've been taught all these years to follow the Bible. But the fluctuation, because it's not within the times, you know, our society is now, if you don't like it, let's change it. And that's basically what I see is going on here. Well, it doesn't fit what we want to do, so let's change it. And I think that is the wrong direction to go for the base of the United Methodist Church. I'm still trying to get your question because you said a whole lot. My question is, we're looking at two parts, one side conservative, one progressive. Right now, there's one part, and I think the primary leaders, especially in this conference, want to go on the progressive side. So that would be your opinion. That is not fact. So let's start there. Those well, are, again, I think that's a question a lot of the people have here. Yeah. Well, I don't know. I don't know why that's a question because again, if I'm a leader for all people, you don't know my position. You haven't asked me one. Two. All right. What is your position? Therefore, again, as I stated just five minutes ago, I'm not sharing that because I'm a, I'm a leader for all persons. And so my positioning related to this matter of human sexuality has absolutely nothing to do with me being a Christ follower and being able to help and encourage people to be disciples of Jesus Christ. To also answer your question related to the understanding of scripture, we both agree that scripture is important. It is the foundation of our faith. The way in which we read it, I would suggest, evolves as we experience God in new and different ways. To make the assertion, falsely in my opinion, that the church split is going to one side or the other makes an inaccurate, inaccurate representation that it's only progressive and only conservative. It's inaccurate. 
because it has nothing to do with sides. That creates battles. This has everything to do with how do we become a greater witness in the world, being and demonstrating being the body of Christ, period. So it will never answer your question because I feel that you have a positioning. And so hopefully what I shared is enough. It probably isn't. But that's where we're going to stand with that question. Well, Other questions? Thank you. I, I don't accept that. Good morning. Good morning. I have a question. Uh, when are we going to see our new pastor in the pulpit? Fantastic question. Yeah, go ahead and share the excitement and the news. So, I, some people may have heard this, and this one's not. Is this one? Oh, the mic. Okay. Um, I am excited that I get to be here for Christmas Eve with all of you. So I will be here for Christmas Eve for is it five o'clock and seven o'clock, both services, and so that'll be the first time I'll be in the pulpit. And then January 16th will be our very first Sunday where then we hit the ground running. But uh, the idea of not being together on Christmas Eve, if we could have worked it out, was just a little bit uh, more than what I wanted to take in. I think it's such a high holy, uh, holy night. If there was a way that we could be together, could we be together? And Dr. Fulbright worked with Pastor Don and said, you know what, it makes a lot of sense for your new pastor to be able to be here with you on Christmas Eve, and so I look forward to that. So that'll be a great question. Awesome. So Christmas Eve, tell your people, invite them out. That'll be the first opportunity that you'll have to experience worship with your new pastor. And then officially on January the 16th, she will be geared and ready and rolling with this place uh, in, in, with, with and alongside you. Um, there was a question also regarding this matter of performing same-gender weddings. First, let me go ahead and dispel that myth, too, that in our Book of Discipline, there is no pastor and or church who is able to perform same-gender unions at this time, period. So my desire, if there was one, I can have the desire all day long, but it's against our Book of Discipline. So that should answer that question. Other questions that have emerged, or other questions that you have? Also, lastly, I want to address that um, there is going to be and has been um, some transition of staff amidst this leadership shift. And so I want to say to not be alarmed by that because it, with any leadership leadership shift, there is going to be transitions because some persons, either the leader and or staff members, may not be aligned with their understanding of how they can serve alongside one another. What I applaud is those staff members that have made the decision to move forward uh, in a new calling of ministry. It doesn't reflect, in my opinion, their inability to want to work with Pastor Amber, it just identifies that they understand that perhaps it's going to be difficult to serve alongside. And what the beauty of that is, it doesn't create internal conflict down the road. It eliminates it so that you can have a fresh start. So if indeed and when there are these lead, uh, leadership shifts, please do not be alarmed. That's part of any transition that there are times in which people just don't align with one another, and that's okay. There will be times in which perhaps you as a congregate may not align for whatever reason, and you may decide that you want to move into a different means of worshiping God in a different faith community. It happens. But what I know to be true is that there are far more who love this church and who are willing to do what is needed and necessary to not only tell neighbor, but also to put their hands to the plow and not look back. I know that to be true about this church. And so when people start leaving, we can't get in an uproar. Oh, the pastors and drove everybody away. Again, more people leave churches because of church people, not the pastor. So then it begs the question, 
How do you begin praying for God to prepare your heart and mind for the work that is ahead in this life of ministry, in this new life and season of ministry here in Morrisville United Methodist Church? That is an individual prayer and a collective commitment. I can't make it for you. I don't know what that means for you. But what I know to be true is that you have a high energy, high capacity pastor along with her family who is ready to do the work of ministry alongside you. And all she needs is a few. And I promise you, she's going to change this place. <laughs> change not in a bad way. Change in a good way, Jesus. <laughs> have to always say that. Also, last, last thing. There was some conversation circulated um, a couple of months ago because we have what is called social media. How many of us have social media? How many of us are on Facebook and Twitter and TikTok and Instagram and Snapchat and... No, not all of that. <laughs> I lost you, all good. So there was some conversation circulating a few months ago related to um, some persons who never friended Pastor Amber but heard about Pastor Amber's Facebook posts, her personal Facebook posts from several years ago in this matter related to Black Lives Matter and also human sexuality, the perceived understanding of where she stood. Friends, my position and the position of the bishop when a pastor is posting on their personal Facebook page, don't friend them. It's their personal page. That does not represent how they lead the church. It could be something that stirs within them regarding the inequities and injustices in this world for which they have a opportunity to share their position. It wasn't on behalf of the church. It was behalf of the individual who so, just so happens to be called pastor. So if you don't agree, don't friend them. If you hear about it, if you didn't see it directly, then how do you make a perception or a bias towards something that you didn't even know about? That's the thing I hate about, and I said hate, and this is being recorded. Social media is because we are so courageous around computer screens, but we don't have the courage to talk to one another to get to know one another face to face. And I think that that is a demise of where we are as the body of Christ, perhaps, is because we get so courageous beyond the screen and we don't truly live out what Christ has called us to live. I would also suggest that in our new iteration of what it means to be the church, we have created over this COVID experience the convenience for people to have church on demand. So many of the congregations, particularly in the Central District and also the West District that I serve alongside, they are lamenting that people are not coming back. And I have to say the hard truth, they're not coming back. We have created church on demand. You can go to any church in the world from the convenience of your pajamas. Who doesn't like that? <laughs> But there are ways and opportunities that there are ministries that are happening that are engaging those even at a distance. And what I know to be true is that when that engagement is relevant for people, they will invest themselves in social Bible studies, giving, and also claiming that that, that church is their church. Case in point, we have a church in Indianapolis. It's a smaller membership congregation. Through COVID, they elevated their online presence and their um, online church experience. And there was a person who engaged in their online church experience over the course of several weeks, for which then that person reached out to the pastor and said, I want to be baptized. This pastor never met this person, only through email, text messages, phone calls, and then a FaceTime. And then that person had the courage to come to that church and be baptized in front of everyone else. Perhaps that's the way the church is moving. And how do we get into the rhythm of that versus fighting it? Because again, we've, we've created this convenience. So this is opportunities where people have the opportunity, where the church has the opportunity to be innovative and to really pray, God, how do we indeed allow your kingdom to come on earth as it is in heaven? There's many possibilities. But you, the people, along with pastor, have to prayerfully prepare hearts and minds and prepare your hands to do the work. It's not going to look like what it was 30 years ago. 
10 years ago, shoot, 2019, it's not going to look like it. But what it is going to do is provide opportunities to deepen individuals' discipleship so that they can go and represent Christ so that other disciples can be known and to be made. I think that's everything on my list. Anything you want to share? Of course. So people get to ask, ask me questions, right? And so I, I think it's only fair that I get to ask some questions of you all. On a Sunday morning, no matter who comes through the doors, are we going to love them? I mean, no question, right? I mean, that's, that's, that's the flavor I got from SPRC. But I'm going to bring six kids. I'm going to bring six kids. And we're going we're gonna to buy a house here. And I want to make sure that we're going to love people, that we're going to have joy in this place, that we're going to have love in this place, that, that we're going to do that. That's what we're going to do. I know General Conference is coming. And you know, Dr. Fulbright just said it's probably not going to be in 2022, might be in 23. They might even push it to 24. So that gives us like three years. Maybe, I mean, it's all the deep unknowns, right? But that gives us three years. And then they're going to vote on stuff, and then, then it's going to be another six months till we get to annual conference, and then we're going to vote at annual conference, and then it's going to eventually come to local. I mean, now we're four or five years in. I, now I'm getting equity in a house. So this is not six months down the road. This is, that's coming in the future somewhere some, sometime. But right now we have people in the community who are exhausted from COVID, who have compassion fatigue who don't know that they are loved, who are just lonely, who need people to go and show them the love of Jesus Christ. No matter their life story, no matter where they come from, no matter if they live in one of the great houses that I see online that I think, oh, that'd be great, or if they're in, you know, that two-bedroom house, or whatever it is, it doesn't matter to me. I just want to love on God's people, no matter who they are. That's the passion that God has put into me. And really, as I come to be your pastor, I really just need some folks who are like, yeah, let's do that. Let's just do that. And then we'll deal with the hard stuff. You'll get to know me. You'll figure out, I just love everybody. That's how I'm wired. That's how I'm made. And even when we have bad days, because we're human beings, occasionally we might, you know, we might actually hangry sometimes, need a Snickers or something, and snap at one another, and we're going to still love each other, because we're going to be family, and that's what families do. So really, before I buy a house, before we move six kids down here, before we get settled, I really just want to know, are we going to love Jesus? Are we going to love our neighbors as ourselves? And we're going to have good worship, passionate worship in the process. We're going to pray. Um, I mean, you said something about my social media. I mean, we're talking so benign on social media. What you will see on my social media, every single Friday, I put out there and have for years. How is it? How can I pray with you or for you? So people all over the world are commenting on that and, and asking that we would pray. And so my congregations have come alongside, and they just follow that on Fridays. So, Kathy, I know you're our prayer warrior, so you and I, on Fridays, we're going to put that out there. There's people from Israel who are asking for prayer. There are people from Africa who are asking for prayer. There are people from Mentone, Indiana, asking for prayer. And then our people get a chance to say, I'm praying too. I'm praying right now. I'm with you. Someone post a Bible verse. That the Spirit just said, post that Bible verse for you. They never even met each other. And then they end up watching Mooresville United Methodist Worship online. Isn't that amazing? They're already asking, when, is, when will it be online? When can we see? When can we be? When can we be a part of this new community? There's already people who are watching you all on Sunday morning just because of the announcement. Because they're like, okay, well, we got to get to know that church now, too. Because, as Dr. Fulbright said, church is on demand. And so people are now participating in three or four different churches because they just enjoy that. And so that's our online presence, and we can be prayer warriors together and make a great difference in people's lives. But for me, we got a lot of work to do. Uh, this has been uh, the last two years. 
I think the time when we have seen people worn out and hungry for God more than ever. They're just exhausted. And so what can we do? How can we support one another? Because I know everyone in this room has some sort of fatigue, some sort of compassion fatigue, some sort of need, some sort of just needing God's spirit to fill us. So we're going to do that for one another so that then we can go and do that in the community. Because that's really what we're called to do. We're called to be sent, not just come here and get fed, but we're called to be sent. And so as we move forward, I really just want us to go show, share, and spread God's love together. And then just trust in the next four or five years, we will have heart-to-heart conversations. We'll study scripture. We'll discern. We'll pray. We will walk through this. There is not one United Methodist that I know. There's not one United Methodist pastor that I know that is not looking at these next few years going, whew, this is going to be tough. Doesn't matter where you are on the spectrum of beliefs. We're all looking at it going, how can we stay united, focused on Jesus Christ, and not let this (coughs) tear apart our local congregations? Well, that's my vision. I think we can all serve God together. We've been doing it. We've been doing that. We serve God together. I uh, shared with SPRC, I grew up a General Motors family. We were not allowed to have Fords parked in our driveway. (laughs) When I was growing up, I didn't think that people that drove Fords were allowed to go to our church. (laughs) Because we were, I, I grew up. The church was in Anderson, Indiana, where General Motors was huge. And you know what? I learned there were people who drove Fords who sat right next to me in church. We didn't even fight. We didn't. Their car actually started after church. I couldn't believe it. And then somewhere along the, oh, Chad's pointing at himself. This is how we know sanctification is real. Chad, my husband, his family is a Ford family. We've been married 23 years. I pray that you continue to pray because I still only want a General Motors car. But we've had Fords along the way. Here's the point. I think maybe you get my point, right? We can disagree on many, many things and still worship the same living God together. We can still go love the community together. We can decide, yep, this is going to divide us, we're done. We can decide that. This is what, cancel culture? That's kind of what they say. I don't believe that God's people are called to be cancel culture people. God's people are called to be all in people, loving neighbor as ourselves. That's what we're called to do. So that's my passion. That's where I am. And I really just want to know. Would this congregation get excited about that? Could we do that together? And then we'll, we'll handle all the other stuff down the road. We'll, we'll walk it together. Whatever it looks like, we'll walk it together. I will not hide from things. We will name them and we will do them. But then we're going to go love Jesus and love this community. That's my passion. That's where I am. And I'm bringing the Brady Bunch. <laughs> get ready. Get ready. Mark. (laughs) Every time Mark raises his hand when we've talked, I always get nervous because I never know what he's going to ask. Go ahead. Relax. I am. Uh, Can we uh, offer uh, Dr. Fulbright and Amber a round of applause and, and thank them for investing their time with us this morning? So that's Mark telling us we're done. So (laughs) I'm joking. (laughs) So I heard the bells and it's about that time where, you know, an hour, we're good. If there's anything else, again, this was intended to be a conversation. You've raised questions. We've had hopefully um, information shared that informs you. It may not change your mind, but it informs you. Is there anything else? A Wesley question is always asked at the conclusion of any gathering. 
Are all hearts clear? It's not rhetorical. Y'all good? That's the question I'm asking. <laughs> Can we go home? That's the other question I'm asking. So, Pastor Amber, I'm going to invite you to send us forward in prayer, please. Hey, Kathy, would you join me? I, I understand that Kathy's the prayer warrior of the church, and as as a, who else is? Not, not me alone. Okay. That's exactly right. Well, you didn't know you were going to be called up in front of everybody, did you? Does that make you nervous? I want to be able to see your faces. Thanks for coming up. Dr. Fulbright, would you come join this group too? Is there anybody else that just wants to come join? I mean, we're, we're inviters. That's what we do. We invite people to join. All right. And let's pray together. Holy and gracious God, we thank you. We thank you for your Holy Spirit that has been at work for years and years in this faith community. God, we thank you for that same spirit that has met us in this place today. And God, we call upon that Holy Spirit to move us forward into the future when we don't even have all the answers, God, but we have faith in you. And so, God, we ask that your spirit would guide us and lead us every step along the way. God, I pray for every person who is here today. I pray for every person who walks through these doors that they would sense and know your love. That they would know they are loved wildly and passionately from the top of their heads to the bottom of their feet. God, I thank you for these prayer partners, prayer warriors. I thank you for Dr. Fulbright and her leadership. God, I thank you for Pastor Dennis and his 15 years. What an honor to get to follow him. And so, God, as we move forward, help us to see your son Jesus in all that we do. God, soften hearts in the community as we prepare to go show, share, and spread your love all throughout this place. God, we pray all this now in the mighty name of Jesus. And everyone said, Amen. Amen. Thank you all for your time, blessed Advent, and I will see you on January the 9th. Amen.